Mr. President, thank you for doing this. Great to be with you. Really appreciate it. I want to get some things on the record. So let's begin with health care. October 1st, it rolls out. Immediately, there are problems with the computers. When did you know there were going to be problems with those computers? Well, I think we all anticipated that there'd be glitches. At the same time, you've got technology, a new program rolling out, there are going to be some glitches. I don't think uh, I anticipated or anybody anticipated uh, the degree of the problems with the website. And so you just didn't know when it rolled out that this was going to well, be Well, I don't think, as I said, I don't think anybody anticipated the, the degree of uh, problems that you've had on healthcare.gov. Uh, the good news is that the right away we decided how we were going to fix it. It got fixed uh, within a month and a half. Uh, it was up and running, and now it's working the way it's supposed to, and we've signed up 3 million people. I don't know about that, because uh, last week there was an Associated Press poll of people who actually went to the website, and only 8% of them feel that it's working well, working well. Why didn't you fire Sibelius, the uh, secretary in charge of this? Because, I mean, she had to know after all those years and all that money that it wasn't going to work. You know, my main priority right now is making sure that it delivers for the American people. And an what, we, what, what we've ended up doing is we've got three million people signed up. So far, we're about a month behind of where we anticipated we wanted to be. We've got over six million people who signed up for Medicaid. Yeah. We've got three million young people uh, under the age of 26 who have signed up on their parents' plan. And so what we're constantly figuring out is how do we continue to improve it? How do we make sure that the folks who don't have health insurance can get health okay. insurance and those who are underinsured are able to get better health insurance? I'm sure, I'm sure that the uh, intent is noble, but I'm a taxpayer. And I'm paying Kathleen Sibelius a salary and she screwed up. And you're not holding her accountable. Well, I, I promise you that we hold everybody up and down the line accountable. But She's when, we're in, when, when we're midstream, Bill, that we want to make sure that our main focus is how do we make this thing work so that people are able to sign up and that's what we've done. All right. Was it the biggest mistake of your presidency to tell the nation over and over, if you like your insurance, you can keep your insurance? So, oh, Bill, you've got a long list of my mistakes. My no, really, for you. Wasn't that the biggest this one? Is, this is one that uh, I regret, and I said I regret it, in part because we put in a grandfather clause in the original law saying that, in fact, you were supposed to be able to keep it. It obviously didn't cover everybody that we needed to, and that's why we changed it so that we further grandfathered in folks, and many people who thought originally when they got that cancellation notice they couldn't keep it on that. It's in the past, but isn't so, that the biggest mistake? Well, I, you know, Bill, I, as I said, you gave your enemies you, a lot you, of fodder. You, you, you were very generous in saying I look pretty good, uh, considering I've been in the presidency for five years, and I think part of the reason is I try to focus not on the fumbles, but on the next plan. All right. Lydia, a hard House Armed Services testimony. General Carter Ham. You know the general, the security in Africa. He testified that on the day that the ambassador was murdered and the three other Americans, all right, he told Secretary Panetta it was a terrorist attack. Shortly after Ham, General Ham said that, Secretary Panetta came in to you. Did he tell you, Secretary Panetta, it was a terrorist attack? You know what he told me was that there was an attack on our compound. He didn't tell. He didn't use the word terror. You know, in. In the heat of the moment, Bill, what folks are focused on is what's happening on the ground. Do we have eyes on it? How can we make sure our folks are safe? I just want to get this on the record. Did he tell you it was a terror attack? Bill, and what I'm, I'm answering your question. What he said to me was, we got an attack on our compound. We no terror yet. attack. We don't know yet who's doing it. Understand by definition, Bill, when somebody is attacking our compound, yeah. that's an act of terror, which is how I characterized it the day it after it happened. So the, so the question ends up being, who, in fact, was attacking us? But it's more than and, that, and that, because of we, Susan Rice. You no, know, it, it's more than that, because if Susan Rice goes out and tells the world that it was a spontaneous demonstration yeah. off a of videotape, but yeah. your your yeah. commanders and the Secretary of Defense know it's a terror attack. Yeah. No, just no, as an American, no. I'm just and, confused. And I'm, and, and I'm trying to explain it to you if you want to listen. The fact of the matter is, is that people understood at the time something very dangerous was happening that we were focused on making sure that we did everything we can could to protect them. In the aftermath, what became clear was that the security was lax, that not all the precautions uh, that needed to be taken were taken. And both myself and Secretary Clinton and others indicated this much. But at the moment, when these things happen, though, on the other side of the world, it's the people, of the people, world. That's, people don't know at the very moment exactly why something like this happens. And when you look at the videotape, of this whole thing unfolding. This is not some systematic 
well-organized process. You see those heavy weapons you use in them. What use, what heavy use weapons. Bill, oh, yeah. Bill, listen, I, I, I've gone through this, and we have had multiple hearings on it. What happens is you have an attack like this taking place, and you have a mix of folks who are just troublemakers. You have folks who have an ideological agenda. You have some who are affiliated with terrorist organizations. You have some that are not. But the main thing that all of us have to take away from this is our diplomats are serving in some very dangerous places. But and, more, we've got to, and, we've got, and we've got to make sure that not only have we implemented all the reforms that were recommended by the independent agency, but we also have to make sure that we understand our folks out there are in a hazardous, dangerous situation. I think everybody and we, and no, but Actually, not everybody does, because what ends up happening, what ends up happening is we end up uh, creating a political agenda on Absolutely. something and that's in which that Democrats and Republicans should be unified in trying to figure out how are we going to protect people. i got to get to the IRS, but I just okay. want to say that there, you, your detractors believe that you did not tell the world it was a terror attack because your campaign didn't want that out. No, that's about, what they believe. And, and, and they believe it because folks like you are telling no, them. I'm not telling them that. I'm but, asking you whether you were and told it was a terror attack. And what I'm and saying you? is that is inaccurate. Uh, we, we revealed to the American people exactly what we understood at the time. The notion that we would hide the ball for political purposes when a week later we all said, in fact, there was a terrorist attack taking place the day after I said it was an act of terror, that wouldn't be a very good cover up. Right. That's what we were. I got to get to the IRS because yeah. I don't know what happened there, and I'm hoping maybe you can tell us. Douglas Shulman, former IRS chief, he was cleared into the White House 157 times, more than any of your cabinet members, more than any other IRS guy in the history by far. Okay, why was Douglas Shulman here 157 times? Mr. Shulman, as the head of the IRS, is constantly coming in because at the time we were trying to set up the uh, uh, healthcare.gov. And the what IRS has to do with that. The IRS is involved in making sure that that works as part of the overall healthcare team. So it was all healthcare. Uh, number two, we've also got the IRS involved when it comes to some of the financial reforms to make sure that we don't have taxpayer uh, funded bailouts in the future. So you have all these different agendas in which the head of the IRS is naturally involved. Did you speak to him a lot? Your I, uh, I do not recall meeting with him in any of these meetings that are pretty routine meetings. Okay, okay. so you don't, you don't recall seeing Shulman because what some people are saying is that the IRS was used at a, at a local level in Cincinnati, maybe other places, to Absolutely. go after him. But how do you know that? Because we, we still don't know what happened. Bill, no, uh, we do. That, that's not what happened. They, folks have, again, had multiple hearings on this. I mean, these kinds of things keep on surfacing, in part because you and your TV station will promote them. But, but, but when folks ask their unanswered questions, no, when you actually look at the stuff, there have been multiple hearings on it. What happened here was is that you got, no a, you got a 501C4 law that people think is confusing. No that the folks did not know how to implement. Okay. Because it basically says, so you're saying if you are involved, no corruption there at all. No. That's not what I'm like. saying. That's actually... No, no, but I want to know what you're saying. You're the leader Absolutely. of the country. You're saying no corruption. No. 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 There, was a, there were some boneheaded decisions bonehead out, of, out of a... But no mass office. corruption. Not even mass corruption. Not even a smidgen of corruption. Okay. Obviously. I got a letter from Kathy LeMaster, Fresno, California. I said I would read one letter for the folks, all right? Mr. President, why do you feel it's necessary to fundamentally transform the nation that has afforded you so much opportunity and success? I don't think we have to fundamentally transform the nation. Those are your words. I think that what we have to do is make sure that here in America, if you work hard, you can get ahead. Bill, you and I benefited from uh, this incredible country of ours, in part because there were good jobs out there that paid a good wage. Because you had public schools that functioned well that we could get scholarships if we didn't come from a wealthy family in order to go to college. Right. That, you know, if you worked hard, not only did you have a good job, but you also had decent benefits, decent health care. They kept me on. And for a lot of folks, we don't have that. We've got to make sure that we're doing everything we can to expand the middle class and work hard. And, and people who are working hard can get into the middle I class. I, I, you know, I know you think maybe we haven't been fair, but I think your heart is in the right place. Prediction for the game. Who's going to win a Super Bowl? I can't make a prediction. I don't know. These guys are too evenly matched. I think it's going to be 24-21, but I don't know who's going to be 24, and I don't know who's going to be 25. Mr. President, thanks very much. I enjoy it. Thank you. Kurt, back to you. All right, thank you to Bill O'Reilly and President Obama for
joining us when we continue here at MetLife Stadium. We'll get back to football as we get you all set.